All right. Well, good afternoon, and thanks for being here. In the last 10 months, we've talked a lot about education spending and education quality. We want to give our kids a quality education without crushing Vermonters and with unsustainable growth year after year. We have to do something different, especially when our student performance is in the middle of the pack in many areas. This is not a critique of students, teachers, or parents, but it does show not enough of the money we're spending on education is making it to our kids. We can't address education quality without addressing education costs and affordability. Because the worst thing we can do in an affordability crisis is making things less affordable while getting the same results. Now, I know it's uncomfortable to talk about affordability when we're talking about kids' education. But we need to be realistic and be honest about what we're getting for the money we spend. Because the truth is, in 2018, we're spending $1.6 billion for education. And today, it's increased almost a $1 billion, $2.4 billion, while educating fewer kids. So today, we're going to focus on education quality, which Interim Secretary Saunders has focused on. Zoe and her team have been working on a listen and learn tour, meeting with educators across the state to understand their needs and priorities and use that information to improve our education system. So far, they've completed the first of two phases of this initiative and will continue to talk with Vermonters to develop some recommendations based on what they've heard. The Agency of Education has also been working on other initiatives to help improve student literacy through their Read Vermont initiative, as well as one-time grants to CTE centers to replace outdated equipment. So with that, I'll turn it over to Secretary Saunders. Thank you, Governor, for the opportunity to provide an update today. The Agency of Education is facilitating a Listen and Learn tour to ground our work in an understanding of the educational priorities of communities across Vermont. The Listen and Learn tour is a critical part of developing the Agency of Education's strategic plan to ensure our efforts support Vermont's short-term and long-term educational needs. Hearing from educators, parents, students, and community members is essential to developing a plan that reflects Vermont's values, promotes measurable academic improvement, and maximizes state resources to achieve our collective hopes and dreams for our students. This work is happening at a critical time when state leaders, including the Commission on the Future of Public Education, educators and community members, are contemplating changes to how we deliver a quality education to every Vermont student in a way that is sustainable. The agency is fully engaged in this work and is committed to supporting our educational partners to create a high quality public education system at a cost taxpayers can afford. The Listen and Learn Tour has five main goals. First, the Agency of Education aims to align its work to regional and local priorities. By engaging stakeholders with immediate knowledge of the challenges that students and educators face every day, the Agency of Education will be better able to tailor support towards effective solutions. Second, the Listen and Learn Tour will help us identify a shared understanding of how the agency can most effectively support high quality teaching and learning. Third, this collaborative process will ultimately inform changes that expand students' access to high quality educational opportunities. Fourth, by providing opportunities to review data and share innovative best practices, the Listen and Learn Tour will identify key opportunities for improving student achievement. Finally, the Listen and Learn Tour will help the Agency of Education develop a strategic plan that meets the state's immediate priorities while supporting the future statewide vision for public education in Vermont. Immediate priorities include supporting landmark legislation, helping struggling school districts, and providing training and support this budgeting cycle. Today I'm pleased to share what we have learned so far and how you can get involved in the weeks ahead. 
the Listen and Learn Tour was designed to be a methodical, data-driven, and participatory process. Phase one of the Listen and Learn Tour involved collecting and analyzing data. The agency published the state profile report in August, which is the first in a series of reports to support our planning efforts. The report presents student performance data, enrollment, staffing, expenditure, and other relevant data to elucidate an understanding of the current state of Vermont's education system. The report reinforced some commonly understood trends about our education system and also illuminated new questions that we are investigating further. I will briefly highlight a few data points um, from that report. Compared to other states, Vermont has very small schools, the highest staffing levels, and the highest expenditure per pupil. According to the National Assessment for Education Progress, Vermont performs higher in reading compared to other states, though that trend has been declining and performs average in math. Overall, enrollment in K-12 public education has decreased by over 14% since 2004. It is important to note that the biggest changes both in enrollment and academic performance occurred before the pandemic. The report also compared trends by size of supervisory union and school districts and found that the smaller supervisory unions and districts tended to serve higher needs students and yet due to budget constraints tended to pay their teachers less. The state profile report will be released, re-released soon to reflect additional context gathered through stakeholder feedback. Also, the agency will release regional reports, education finance reports, and other topical reports over the coming year. Through phase two of the Listen and Learn Tour, agency staff tra traveled all across the state to facilitate regional planning sessions with over 250 education leaders. In these sessions, we reviewed regional data and reflected on the similarities and uniqueness of each region. Discussions focused on important education topics, ranging from academic performance and accountability, college and career readiness, student mental health, and data needed to inform budgeting decisions. We captured themes about the challenges and opportunities of our system, including the role of the agency of education and how to achieve scale. Several common themes emerged and include the need for reliable, accessible, and easy to use data, a focus on expanding access to college and career readiness opportunities. There's a need to balance local autonomy with the desire for clearer direction from the Agency of Education to support academic outcomes. There's a recognition that student mental health needs reflect community needs and require integrated solutions. We also heard that issues related to housing, affordability, loss of jobs also impact schools in relation to teacher recruitment and student enrollment. Lastly, we heard that more guidance is needed on short-term cost containment strategies and how to design and measure long-term transformation for our education system. During phase three of the Listen and Learn Tour, we will host seven in-person public engagement sessions and two virtual sessions between October 22nd and November 7th. Each public engagement session will take place from 6 to 8 p.m. Every session will begin with introductory information and data to support more in-depth conversations, followed by breakout sessions on topics related to student achievement and support, career and college readiness, and school budgets, among other emerging priorities. The Vermont Agency of Education invites students, parents, educators, and community members to participate. These sessions provide an opportunity for Vermonters to share their ideas for how the Agency of Education can help improve education in Vermont. For more details on the dates, locations, and accessibility options, please visit the Agency of Education website. While engaged in a longer term planning process, the agency recognizes the need to address immediate needs for schools, educators, and students now. To this end, the agency has rolled out key initiatives to support literacy, college and career readiness, and school budgets. The Agency of Education launched Read Vermont. Read Vermont is a statewide comprehensive initiative to improve literacy outcomes by ensuring that every Vermont student 
has access to high quality reading and writing instruction grounded in the science of reading. The science of reading is based on a compendium of research across multiple disciplines that's been validated over decades. At the heart of Read Vermont is a shared vision for literacy, delivering high quality, systematic, and explicit instruction that equips every child with the foundational skills necessary to successfully engage with text and experience the joy and utility of reading. Recommendations from the Advi Vermont Advisory Council on Literacy were critical in the design and implementation of Read Vermont. Common themes from the council and engagement with leaders and educators across the state include the following. The need for resources that support the implementation of evidence-based literacy instruction and assessment in Vermont Supervisory Union and districts and classrooms. The need for high quality professional learning and job embedded coaching that supports classroom educators in putting research into practice. There's also the need for agency resources, guidance, and accountability measures to guide this shift in curriculum, instruction, and assessment. Read Vermont priori priorities include building capacity at the state level and also the local level, along with providing resources to families and caregivers. The agency will provide professional learning opportunities and job embedded coaching to support the shift to the science of reading. And this work draws upon lessons learned in schools in Vermont that have effectively made this shift and have strengthened student outcomes. I would like to highlight two examples of school districts that we have learned from in designing the agency's support. Mill River Unified Union School District started their journey to the shift to the science of reading in 2021 after engaging in intensive coaching and professional learning offered through the Agency of Education. As context, Mill River District is a small rural district that has aligned curriculum across their schools. Shifting to the science of reading, Mill River took a data-driven approach and focused on high quality core instruction. For instance, they set a goal that by the end of kindergarten, all children would be able to read and write consonant, vowel, and consonant words, including in a personally meaningful text. In November of 2021, only 7% of kindergarten, kindergartners could do this. Teachers were unsure how they would cl be close to coming to meet the goal. But through professional learning and coaching, students really made tremendous gains. In May of 2022, 92% of kindergartners were able to read and write these words. They experienced teacher and leadership learning that was contagious and built collegiality across the schools. This shift has taken time and is an ongoing process that requires new learning, alignment of resources, and structures to sustain the work. This shift has resulted in longitudinal growth for the district, demonstrated in their local assessments, and also improvement among their literacy scores. White River Valley is another success story when it comes to improving literacy. White River Valley is a rural district with high poverty that has worked intentionally over the last four years to shift to the science of reading and putting systems in place to ensure data-driven decision-making. They have taken a multifaceted approach, including professional development with all reading interventionists, a K-12 curriculum um, by identifying critical proficiencies and priority performance indicators with support of the Agency of Education. They have implemented a universal K-12 screener with an additional diagnostic screener and additional reading screener at grades seven through 12 that target foundational skills. And they have implemented data team structures in all schools beginning in the 2022-2023 school year. As a result, they have established strong systems to support data-driven decision-making and a continuous improvement culture among educators and leadership. Their comprehensive approach is having an impact on students. In White River Valley School District, 70% of fourth graders demonstrated proficiency on the Vermont Comprehensive Assessment Program last year, which is nearly 20% above the state average. We learned from these districts and are working to respond to the support needed in the field. Read Vermont is a new way for the Agency of Education to support major legislation in response to feedback and providing explicit guidance and support around what works with the goal of promoting consistent outcomes and improving literacy statewide. College and career readiness 
is another key focus of the Agency of Education and has been a long-standing commitment of Governor Scott. The governor recently invested over $1 million of remaining Governor's Education Relief Funds in grants to purchase much-needed equipment at career and technical centers. Several grants funded the replacement of aging, outdated, and non-functioning equipment. As examples, four tech centers purchased new lifts for their auto technology program. Stafford Technical Center purchased a new alignment system for its automotive program. And North Country Career Center and River Valley Technical Center purchased new commercial grade ovens for their culinary arts programs. Grants were also used to increase access to work-based learning placements. Wyndham Regional Career Center, Patricia Hannaford Career Center, and Randolph Technical Center purchased used vans to support stu transportation to stu for students to get to their clinical skills and paid work-based learning placements. This will significantly increase the opportunities for students in rural communities where public transportation is not readily available. Additionally, grants funded the expansion of new and high demand programs, including purchasing welding equipment for programs at Central Vermont Career Center, Northwest Career and Technical Center, North Country Career Center, and Linden Institute. Lastly, grants provided industry standard equipment for students to learn on, including a backhoe with front loader at Cold Hollow Career Center, mini loader at North Country Career Center, and tractor for use in the diversified agricultural program at Hartford Area Career and Technical Center. Lastly, the Agency of Education is ramping up support for school budgeting and training on Vermont's education finance system. We are in the process of developing a training series to educate the public on key components of our funding system, and we will also offer targeted support to school districts. As we progress with the Listen and Learn Tour, we look forward to learning from Vermonters across the state. The input will help the agency organize its work to align with Vermont's current and future educational needs. We hope you will join us for the Listen and Learn public engagement sessions starting on October 22nd and running through November 7th. In-person sessions will be hosted at school locations in different parts of Vermont, and we will also host virtual sessions. Thank you for the opportunity to, sh to share an update on the agency's Listen and Learn tour, and also to communicate early initiatives that we have rolled out. We look forward to the ongoing collaboration. Together, we will build a brighter future for all of Vermont children. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Zoe. Uh, we'll now open up to questions. Governor, budgets are made at the local level, as you know, made by school districts. I'm wondering what you, what this guidance from AOE to local districts, who some would argue are the experts in making their own local budgets, what would that guidance look like? Zoe? So through our Listen and Learn tour, we engage education leaders and school board members in asking the question, how can the Agency of Education support you in this budgeting cycle? And what we heard was that there's a lot of confusion around our education finance system. And there's a responsibility and an opportunity for the Agency of Education to promote broader understanding of how our funding system works. So in the coming weeks, we'll re release a report um, that communicates our funding system and also compares how Vermont funds schools to other states across the country uh, to provide transparency to the process so that voters understand um, how the budgets are made um, and how their uh, vote actually will impact taxes as well as school quality. This Read Vermont initiative that you mentioned, does this cost local districts anything and does this cost like the state, are we budgeting for this? Just what's the price tag on this? Absolutely. So Read Vermont is a little over a million dollars of an investment. Uh, we were able to use remaining ESSER funds and some other braided funding sources. We are working intentionally to develop a sustainability plan and have also identified other sources that can be leveraged for this purpose um, beyond the use of the current funds. You're also earlier, I'm sure you were at the meeting when the report was issued, I think it was anywhere from three to maybe $400 million that if the state, I mean, I don't think, even Chair Kornheiser said it's not a, a proposal per se, but there was an idea that was floated if we, you know, drastically rearranged our system that it could work with our, our current model. I just wanted to get your, and maybe the governor's thoughts on, you know, what, what did you make of, of that report? Do you want me to go first? Or do you want to go? Okay. 
Um, so you're referencing a report that the General Assembly commissioned um, to evaluate our funding system and to provide a recommendation around what would be called an adequacy amount. Um, so the report um, really highlights that you know, there is a path forward uh, to be able to have higher academic outcomes at a lower rate. Um, the challenges within the Vermont context, what will that look like? Um, I think we need to be able to understand how other systems fund education and also look at our own system around what are the assumptions and our incentives that are built in um, to our education funding model. Um, and how do we look forward to moving forward where we really are building upon the strengths of Vermont and what works well while ensuring that that's sustainable over time? Um, the strategies that are outlined in that report are, I think, common list of strategies that um, states would employ to think about affordability and quality um, and include many of the recommendations that the governor has mentioned in the past, including class size, reducing teacher numbers, reducing administrators, consolidating schools, increasing the size of school districts to achieve economies of scale. And, and while those things seem straightforward, in actuality, they're very challenging to implement. Um, and so part of the conversation as we are going through the Listen and Learn tour um, is how do we think about this within the Vermont context? And I think it's important for us as we engage in this work um, to really establish how we're defining financial effectiveness and how we're defining educational quality. Um, and so if school districts are able to achieve that financial benchmark um, and deliver high quality education, uh, then we're in a good position. Um, if they're struggling to do that, then we start to look at some menus of, uh, menu of options uh, to help support those districts in being able to, I think, achieve what we all hope is that we have an excellent world-class education for our students at a rate that we can sustain over time and is affordable to taxpayers. For I can both of you, this um, public engagement tour, how did you choose the seven districts that so as we, um, for the, so there's three phases of the tour. In phase two of the Listen and Learn, we engaged in regional planning sessions with education leaders. And we had to think about how do we define regions in Vermont? Um, and so what we did is we actually looked at the Regional Superintendents Association has defined boundaries of regions for how educators collaborate and work together. Um, and we use that as a foundation uh, to be able to engage with those education leaders in that planning. As we look to phase three of the um, Listen and Learn Tour, where we're having public engagement sessions, it's a matter of looking at the map and trying to be um, as representative as possible and working with our partners at the school level to help host um, and put on these sessions. Uh, so we realize that we can't be everywhere um, in the next month, which is why we're also offering virtual sessions um, to accommodate those that may not be able to travel to these locations that have been identified. So these look, it's, it's not necessarily that only families or residents of these specific school districts should go to these it could be some of that's correct okay. yeah that's correct um, we we have multiple sessions um, across the state so we encourage Vermonters to go to the session that's most convenient to them if they're not able to go in person that's why we'll be hosting two separate virtual sessions um, we it's really important for us that this um, engagement effort um, really supports broad participation um, which is why we've tried to have a number of sessions in different locations and also uh, different ways to participate both in person and virtual to support that. Will both of you be in person? Uh, some of the sessions we will have to divide and conquer um, because you'll notice I think on the schedule we did have some that end up coming on the same day. Um, so again this is an agency-wide effort. This is a team approach to this work um, and everyone uh, within our team at the agency is really involved um, in the Listen and Learn tour and really um, understanding what we're hearing and how we can support the field and being most responsive. Governor, will you be going to any of them? I haven't made that decision at this point. Um, but I also would like to add that, you know, listening and learning never ends. Um, <laughs> it's not just these seven or whatever number there is. Um, there's a long ways to go with this. So we continue to, to engage with the general public and hear uh, their thoughts. And, you know, I think once again, we should go back and probably dust off uh, now 39 studies have been done over the last 20 years and see if there's a common thread there. Is there something we can learn from past studies uh, in conjunction with what we're learning as we go out in the field? So again, this, these are just trying to get as much information as possible 
uh, so that we can go to the legislature and, and offer some suggestions as we have for the last eight years. But there's nothing like in the PICAS report uh, that we we saw that um, that was surprising or new. Governor, I want to ask about the family shelters. The state is now working to stand up. These evictions from the motel program have been ongoing for the last month. So why make this decision to, to open shelters now? Well, again, we didn't know what the magnitude, how many people we would need to uh, fill the gap and falling through the, the cracks, so to speak. Understanding the GA program will, will um, the winter conditions will come into play in December. Um, so now that we have that information and trying to figure out where we have capacity, um, we've decided to move forward on that. Uh, again, Williston is one, and we have to engage with the communities on this, uh, which we've had some outreach, um, but, um, but we have to finalize that. And uh, just a, some minor, minor fit up uh, that we need to, to accomplish with uh, Williston. Uh, Waterbury um, is set to go. Uh, we just need some buy-in from the community in order to do that. Uh, there's a couple of homes uh, or houses uh, that we have, structures here in Montpelier uh, that we might put into play. Uh, those may take a little bit longer, but uh, again, uh, those are areas where we think we can move forward. The biggest, um, the most complex, I think the biggest need is in Rutland. And, uh, and that is ongoing. Uh, the diocese wants to make sure that we have a provider there. Uh, the provider that was uh, we thought was originally interested has backed out. And that remains to be the biggest obstacle. We need someone to run these, this shelter in Rutland where there's the highest need. So we've engaged with Rutland. Uh, we're continuing to, to track down any leads we have on that. If anyone has any ideas, uh, we're all ears because um, we have the facility, the diocese uh, has that available, um, but we need to have a provider there in place before they're ready to open that up. Does the state have providers set up for the Williston, Waterbury, and, and Montpelier locations that you're working on? Um, no, that's been a bit of a challenge as well. Uh, we thought we had some interest in Chittenden County uh, right now, uh, there is no one who is committed to that. Uh, so we're we're going to get creative and figure this out and uh, and do our best to open these up. Does that feel like a realistic task over the next I do. two weeks? I think so. Sure. I mean, we're talking about a limited number. These are family for families, right? Not individuals. Um, so we're not talking about a huge number. So I think it's uh, I think it's doable. We just have to again, get creative in how we approach this. And hopefully, we'll have uh, some provider who will step up. And how many families has the state identified as, as needing these well, shelters? Well, we know, uh, for instance, the six who were in uh, uh, at North Beach in Burlington, I think they were evicted or asked to leave yesterday. Uh, they shut off the water there. We'd asked that they keep it on for another week or so, but for whatever reason, that wasn't possible. Um, so uh, there's those, we, we want to make sure that we have um, a place available for them in the next week or two. And um, I think, again, the biggest need is in Rotland. Um, so we have, I think, six, six families, maybe a couple more in the Chittenden County area. And I believe there's some in the Barrie area, but the vast majority uh, are in Rutland. Yeah, just, just trying to square the scale, because DCF told me yesterday that 300 children had been, you know, evicted from the program over the last month. Or and left the program. These, uh, these numbers are, you know, much smaller than the, that you're saying are in need. So how is the state determining which families who have left are in need of shelter right well, now? Well, again, the ones who maybe they've engaged with us on, uh, we haven't heard uh, from others. Uh, so maybe there's more, I don't know. Uh, but we don't have the information as to where they went when they left the program. So they may be family members. Um, we don't believe they are out on the street, but but we'll find out. And now that people have left um, and are, are scattered, like you're saying, how does the state plan to notify people that these shelters will be available? Well, through all of you, uh, for instance, we don't have a direct connection with them because we don't know where they are at this point. 
um, but, um, but we'll make that information available to all of you and hopefully we'll uh, figure out from there what the, what the need is. And, and you know, why, why the focus on families with kids specifically? You know, people exiting this program also have, there, there are many people with complex medical needs, elderly people, people fleeing domestic violence situations, so. Well, again, I, I don't know if I, I would say that if there are people uh, who are in uh, a situation where they have a disability of some sort and they were, they're falling through the crack, um, disability is characterized in different ways. So uh, I just want to make sure that those who are impacted, those who are truly disabled, um, were able to meet their needs as well. And I believe we're interacting with them. I'm going to ask uh, Commissioner Winters uh, to weigh in on this as well. Um, but um, but again, from my standpoint, you know, uh, kids kids come first. They're the most vulnerable. They're caught in the middle of this uh, situation, and uh, I want to do everything we can uh, to help them. Commissioner Winters, anything you can tell us about others, individuals, and how we're engaging with them to figure out what their their needs are? Yeah, thank you, Governor. Um, we are trying to make the best connections that we can through our field services team, through our local community providers, through our Office of Economic Opportunity to try to identify who the most vulnerable folks are right now who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness. Um, I think it's, you know, it's a few dozen uh, kids at, at this point, and that's become uh, our most immediate need and our priority to move forward with some of these shelters. We do know that there are other medically vulnerable people who come, uh, who are brought to our attention. We try to make sure they are connected with all the services and all the benefits that they are eligible for. Um, so I think there are a lot of success stories out there with folks getting the help that they need and, and moving into uh, more permanent housing situations. It's a, it's a really difficult task to try to really understand what the unsheltered needs are. As the, the governor said, they don't always um, stay in contact with the state or, or let us know where they're going. Um, I think it's going to change every single day, so we're going to continue to try to collect that data and assess the need on the ground. Um, we're also trying to take into account the other seasonal shelter space that's coming open, uh, the viability of some of the other projects coming online from the $10 million in funding. And I think just to turn back to, to what the governor was emphasizing, and as I've said many times before in testimony and in conversation with communities, creating additional shelter space is really challenging. Um, you need an acceptable building, you need a supportive community, and you need a trusted provider uh, to make sure that it's safely run and that the people there are well supported. And so we're coming forward with the use of state-owned buildings in Williston, Waterbury, and Montpelier, uh, but we still do need to have a provider. There are so many partner organizations and advocates out there who are emphasizing the urgency of this moment, the need for more shelter space, um, and we're confident that um, those nonprofit and community organizations will step forward, will help make this a reality. Um, but I do have to say before I go any further, we really appreciate the work of those local providers to serve all of those experiencing homelessness. We should be grateful for that. And we're really looking forward to partnering with them to set up some additional shelter space. Um, speaking of funding, the Agency of Human Services said yesterday to me that they're kind of using some of the $10 million for these family shelters. I was wondering if you knew where all that money was coming from, how much it is, and then these families, once adverse weather starts, are these shelters going to carry throughout the winter, or will they then fall back into the adverse weather conditions and go yeah. back to rooms? I, I would assume that it would be a little bit of a combination of both. Um, there, there is some money. I know I'm going to let, again, uh, Chris talk about this a little bit more, but uh, for instance, we hope the highest need, as I said, uh, is in the Rutland County area. Um, so we want to make sure to preserve enough funding there to follow through on what we've committed to, uh, what they need, and, uh, and that's, a, that's a big number. So again, we want to make sure that we have uh, that capacity uh, to put into place uh, some of these shelters we know we need uh, for a longer term. Commissioner Winters? 
Thank you, Governor. I think that's right. That it's kind of an all of the above approach. We are um, hopefully going to get a shelter off the ground in Rutland, and there's some of that 10 million dedicated to that. We have five other projects scattered throughout the state. Um, and then we're looking at these three additional family shelters. To answer the previous question, we would intend for those to continue through the winter, uh, even if the um, the hotel, when the hotel motel program expands again December 1st. Uh, but these are emergency temporary shelters that we're looking at for the families most in need right now. For the family shelters, are you including in this planning process um, transportation for kids to get to school, particularly? With the yeah, I've been, I've been contemplating that as well. And I would think that we want to make sure that the there's a continuity there um, for the kids if they need to get to a particular school. That's my thought is uh, that we, we do all we can to make sure that we, we get them uh, the transportation they need to stay in, a, in an environment that they're familiar with. That's my feeling. But uh, we haven't talked about this, but it's something I have thought about. Chris, anything that I'm missing there? And maybe Zoe as well. Zoe, no, maybe I don't Zoe. think so, Governor. We do, um, with, within the general assistance emergency housing hotel program, we try to keep children and families close to their support systems, close to their schools. There are times when they do have to move out of district in order to, to have a room. Uh, but in those instances, we do work to provide transportation to keep some continuity for those kids in, uh, in their schools. Again, I might just add, um, this could be a short-term solution for some of these families. So um, it'd be important, again, from my standpoint, to make sure that we have some consistency. I don't think any of the experts on my team on the call, but there is some federal funding through McKinney-Vento to support transportation for homeless students. Um, so our team is also part of this conversation. I was going to add, it's a little bit weedy, but where the money would come from to provide for that transportation, like would it have to come out the local school budgets or would it come from AHS or where does that? So I'd have to have members of my team to walk through that, okay. the mechanics of it. Yeah. Um, but I, I think the intent has been articulated and figuring out how we support that is part of the process. Okay. And again, I think we can get somewhat creative with that. We're talking about a smaller number. Mm -hmm. uh, so we want to make sure that we can fulfill that need one way or the other. What will the, the spaces look like, you know, for a family who's anticipating maybe trying to get into one of these in November? Should they be picturing something like the shelters the state stood up in March or um, no, something, something I, I, different? I would say somewhat different uh, from those we did in March. Those are more congregate uh, shelters, broader. Um, these are more confined. Think uh, office space. Think a room this size for a sleeping arrangement. Uh, they won't have kitchens and so forth, but there will be a, uh, in, in some places like the Williston Barracks, there will be a kitchen available there, one, um, to be utilized in some respect. So again, it's um, it will be separated, uh, it will be get the, the family separated uh, from each other, and um, but in smaller type rooms and segregated. Almost like dorms? Maybe. Yeah, I mean, that's a good analogy um, without all the nightlife. Where did the idea for this come from? Does this come from you at the top, or did AHS and DCF kind of have this in their back pocket waiting to see things play out? Where did kind of this all start spurring? I, I, I don't know where it all started, uh, to be honest with you, but um, we've, we've talked about, I mean, this has been churning for a while. You know, what about state space? What do we have available? Um, so we had uh, um, BGS to take a look and do an inventory of what we had and uh, what would be most viable, where is it, is it closest to the need. And, and again, the physical space is just one aspect of the need, right? You need the, the, the oversight, uh, you need a provider there uh, as well. So it's, uh, it's not just the space, it's, it's the, other, the other piece of this. And is it in an area where transportation uh, is available and so we can continue to get people back on their feet. Secretary Saunders, I'm curious, what have you heard from schools on the ground in terms of students who have been evicted from the motel program? Are kids still coming to school or are the schools in touch with them? What have you heard? 
Um, so I don't have members of my team to speak to that, but there's certainly a conversation with the districts to make sure that there is that coordination when these type of changes happen. It's challenging, right? And so I know that there's every effort being put into place to make sure that there's clear communication across those districts um, to provide continuity of educational delivery for those students. Um, but it certainly is challenging uh, to navigate, and I know our team has been in conversations um, with our superintendents and principals in the field um, through this process. Okay. Uh, we'll switch over to the phones now. Keith Whitcomb, Rutland Herald. Uh, hi, I was curious. Um, I know a few people who live in the Cortina Inn in Rutland, and a big problem they're bumping into with uh, finding an apartment is they keep running into like um, fake listings, scams, and that's if they can find anything at all. I was just curious if the state has any kind of resource for these people just to, you know, help them find a place basically to live? I don't know if there's anything like that or what the plan is. Yeah, I would think with uh, the resources we have in our designated agencies, there's probably help available. I'm not sure what that looks like, and maybe Commissioner Winters has an idea on that and what, maybe what we're doing, um, but I would think that there, there is help there uh, for those, the Cortina, to, uh, to run those down to make sure that they're viable. Governor, I don't have any specifics to add, but can get back to folks on that. I do know that people who are in the general assistance program get hooked into the coordinated entry system and are provided with some with um, resources available to them for housing navigation for helping to find permanent housing. Also, the local providers on the ground are certainly working with uh, folks experiencing homelessness to help them navigate the, uh, the housing crisis that's out there and help them find what apartments are available. Um, this is really important as well, uh, Keith, if you, uh, if you have information. I mean, there's a lot of, we hear a lot about um, people who have issues and we don't know who they are. Um, they're uh, not really identified, they're just described, and if we, had more information on them, had them contact the uh, Department of Children and Families. Uh, that's a place to start so that we can, we can get the ball rolling. But if, um, if they're just telling you and not telling us, uh, then there's a disconnect. So uh, if, there's a, is, if there's a situation that you're aware of that we should know about, uh, don't assume that we know it. And don't assume that we, we know who they are. Um, because the description, sometimes we try and track that down and pick them up empty-handed. All right, I'll make sure they know. Thank you. Back to the room. Um, the Washington Union School District scrapped its plans to close two elementary schools. Um, I'm just wondering what you both make of that decision and then just generally the kind of conundrum of trying to rein in education yeah. costs when there's such a reluctance to Again, I, I think this is you know, an example of the challenge that we face here. We have a declining student population. Our demographics are working against us. We have workforce challenges. We have affordability challenges, uh, all the above. And when you have two small schools like that that can't come to agreement that they probably should merge, uh, that is going to be replicated. Uh, and that, that's why I'm saying this, I don't take this lightly. I don't take this for granted. This is tough stuff. This is difficult. Um, there's a lot, a lot of nostalgia uh, as well that enters into this. But um, but I go back to you know my hometown of Barrie, uh, where there was seven or eight elementary schools at one time, and they had to come to the conclusion that we should have one, not seven or eight, and uh, and they did that. Um, you, you know I. I hate to bring this up because it'll just open open the door, but you know it's like our healthcare system. It's the same kind of issues. Um, they're both difficult, um, but we have to rein in uh, healthcare costs. We have to rein in some of the education costs because that's where we, when we fund them, um, it comes through property taxes or any pocket. It comes out of the pocket of Vermonters. So. So again, uh, this is uh, this is going to be challenging. We, I've said it for years. You have a you have Montpelier High School right here, and uh, you know three or four miles down the road you have another high school. 
uh, have another one in Northfield, have another one in Barrie, have another one in, you know, Waterbury. I mean, it's like we have to consider some sort of consolidation across the board in different ways without losing the community. You know, we need something there. The glue that holds the communities together is important as well. So we have one more question online. Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. Yeah, good afternoon, Governor. Uh, I'd like to start first by uh, thanking Joe Flynn uh, for responding to an uh, issue up in uh, Brighton, Brighton that I raised a couple weeks ago. Uh, he took some very prompt response, and it's appreciated. But, that was the bridge um, issue, Ed. Yes, Ed. yes. They're not going to get a bridge, but at least they have the opportunity to make their case. Yes. Uh, what I'm raising today is a little bit technical and it probably be better answered by uh, PUC of the Department of Public Service. But I was uh, at a meeting uh, with the Barton Village Trustees. Um, the Barton Electric Department had undergone a uh, operations audit and they realized that the Orleans County Fair Association was placed in the wrong category for their rates. They were uh, moved into what's called a large commercial demand um, because they have high usage three months a year, uh, which is Memorial Day, July 4th, and then September when they have the county fair. When they got moved into large commercial rates, uh, the large commercial demand, um, their tariff, the tariff uh, raised their costs significantly. And as an example, without any change in electric consumption, last year they paid $15,660. This year, at the end of, uh, of uh, August, they already paid 19000 They anticipate September that they'll be paying another 10000 for the uh, county fair. So they're up at 29000 They still have three months to go in the calendar year. Um, and probably this is true in all fair associations which are seasonal in operation. They can't afford to take that kind of a financial hit. So I don't know if this is something that involves FERC or if it involves the state having some jurisdiction to uh, take a, a look at the, the, the uh, relationship between seasonal county fairs and that tariff and perhaps move them into a different category that would be uh, more consistent with their overall annual usage. Um, there's nobody on from public service today, Ed, but I will make sure somebody gets a, in touch with you uh, to at least describe you know, the path forward there. And again, I, I understand how challenging that can be. Um, Orleans, when we were up there uh, last uh, couple weeks ago, uh, we were at Ethan Allen Furniture. and. Uh, and they were told that the rates were going to increase by 14%, and they thought that that was going to be difficult for them, but yet the utility is saying, you know, we got to survive here, we need to increase our rates. And now you're coming with this uh, issue where the, where the fair is saying we can't survive uh, with increased rates and, uh, and through no fault of their own. Um, but uh, again, it's just a, a constant churn here. So. Uh, suffice it to say, um, we hear all the above. Um, this is the first I've heard of it. But uh, we'll have somebody from public service get in touch with you to describe that so you can better describe it to them. Or we can get a hold of the fairgrounds and the utility through the public service department. OK, I appreciate it. I mean, yeah, um, their uh, insurance rates doubled from 1200 a month, more than doubled from 1200 a month to $2,500 as well. So it, it kind of leaves them in a difficult financial position. But I'd appreciate it if somebody in the administration would get back to me. Yeah, the affordability crisis that we uh, have talked about for the last eight years is real. So, and it's, uh, it's becoming supercharged at this point. I, I hear you and I believe you. Thank you very much. Going back to the emergency shelters, I just got an email from Tom Lights, the municipal manager for Waterbury. He's saying the state has not contacted him or the town once about these emergency shelters. He just found out yesterday from all of our various different news reports. And he says if the state plans on staffing it, 
with a third party, which is what it sounds like the plan that would have to go through a new zoning permit because right now it's only operational for state, you know, media leases that could take months just kind of looking to a response for that. Um, that is the challenge we face with almost every community. Um, very difficult to put an emergency shelter anywhere in the state. So um, uh, we have heard uh, previously uh, when we outfitted the armory uh, that they were not willing to let us move forward so um, without a zoning permit. So it's not a surprise, but thanks for the information. We'll take it up with them. Sort of the flip side of that question, I mean, the service provider nonprofit community has, has expressed that they're really at capacity with the work they have in front of them right now. Would the state be willing to staff these shelters with state employees or, or yeah, other I mean, That's what I was kind of getting at. Uh, we may have to get creative. Uh, and I don't think the staffing would be um, as maybe concentrated uh, as it is with the, with the providers uh, that we have, with, especially with, when you're talking with individuals. Um, so we'll have to see. If we, if we hit a brick wall uh, in some respects, we'll have, to, we'll have to get creative, and that's one of the ideas that we'll have to contemplate. All right, we're now at about one o'clock, Calvin. I don't know if you had one more question or yeah. Okay. okay. Who are you voting for? Uh, she's a, a <laughs> surprise, shocked at that question. Um, as uh, I said before, I won't be voting for Donald Trump, um, but I haven't made a decision as to who I will vote for, and uh, I will make sure that everyone is aware of that after I make that decision. We're mere weeks away. Yeah, I know. We'll have to hear in four weeks. You won't be asking that question. Are you mailing in your ballot or voting in person? Um, I will probably vote in person. On election day? Typically. Okay. I'll see you at the polling place. Okay. Get there early. <laughs> Secretary Saunders, it almost seemed like you were going to say add something on the Washington Union subject. I mean, I think to reinforce what the governor mentioned, um, you know, closing a school is a very difficult decision, maybe one of the most difficult decisions for a school district or a community to make. Um, and so as, you know, I think as districts are contemplating it, um, it's important that there is a clarity around what are some of the parameters that you might consider. Um, and as we've talked with education leaders across the state, many of them have said if we kind of understood what the parameters and the goals were, we might be able to come up with some strategies from the ground up um, that really could work um, for our communities. And I think part of the shift is um, moving from focusing on loss to focusing on opportunity for students is a really critical uh, transition to make as we think about um, making decisions that are in the best interest of students' educational opportunities and that they have a rich and diverse offering of programs, they're able to participate in electives and sports and things of that nature. Um, so that's a lot of what we're hearing from the agency as we're going around the state is um, this is really challenging work um, and right now there's not real clear parameters as districts are engaging in that, um, but also again that focus on on transition to opportunity. Um, something that came up through our planning sessions was this term actionable hope, right? There's actually a lot of aspiration and hope in this challenging work on how we can create better opportunities for students and ensure that we do have a funding system that's equitable um, and that no matter what community that you live in in the state of Vermont, your, your child has a great opportunity and is going to thrive. Um, and some communities are supporting that and they're able to do that, but other communities aren't. Um, and so that's really the challenge here is we think about what's in the best interest of our local community and we also need to think about what's in the best interest of our shared community of the state of Vermont. Um, and so hopefully that'll be part of what we continue to engage in these conversations and provide more clarity and coherence and kind of shared understanding of what that looks like. For either of you, is there a point in this debate where you think that the state needs to step in and start getting more prescriptive with local districts? in terms of this question and, and the kind of wrestling with local control? Yeah, I mean, I think um, we'll have to see where this goes. I mean, we've had challenges enough getting some far simpler things accomplished in the legislature over the last eight years, so um, this would be difficult uh, to do, to implement and force. But we'll, uh, we'll have conversations with the legislature and see what the art of the possible is. 
Thank you all.